So thanks a lot, and thanks for giving the opportunity to present <coughs> results from the astronomical survey for astroseismology and galactic archaeology, aka SAGA, which is a collaborative effort involving a number of persons, uh, some sitting here in the room and highlighted here in, uh, in color. And to convince you, we are a real survey, we have a website and a logo. So can't get more real than that. Well, maybe we can start printing t-shirts at max, but anyway, why I find this exciting is because this topic really bridges between two different fields. One is the galaxy and the other is about the stars. So uh, relax a couple of slides about the galaxy before we go back to the stars. And so why this is important, which are the sort of like stellar constraints that we need if we want to understand about the galaxy. So here is just a very brief sketch. We have a galaxy and the solar neighborhood. Uh, we are sitting up there. And, um, and we have like infall of primordial gas. So there is this infall of gas which falls on the galaxy. And then essentially, well, star formation takes place. You form gas <coughs> from the gas. You form stars. You have low mass stars, which essentially they lock the chemical content of the interstellar medium at the time and the place of the formation of those stars. Whereas more massive stars, they evolve, stellar winds, stellar yields, supernovae, they enrich the medium, and then they return those material and new generation of stars are formed. And so you can follow this, especially if you, well, for practical purposes, you can divide the galaxy in different rings, and in each of those rings you follow this evolution. And then at your end point, you see what you get, and you compare with the observations. And so the important observational constraints here are the metallicity distribution function, which is essentially the number of stars in a given metallicity, and I'm talking about long-lived stars, because those are like the fossils, which are from different epochs when the galaxy formed. And beside that, another fundamental constraint is the age metallicity relation, which essentially it tells you how the chemical enrichment has been going on throughout cosmic evolution in the galaxy. And here you see that essentially in each ring you have like this uh, sort of like monotonic increase in terms of age versus the metallicity content. And so what happened then if we introduce a bit of a dynamic and we let stars or gas uh, to flow and uh, move around? So essentially, well, nowadays it's, it's, it's sort of a very popular topic in terms of radial migrations of stars in the galaxy. And the bottom line here is that essentially you can have stars from the inner part of the galaxy which are preferentially more metal rich and they move outwards and vice versa, stars from the outer side part of the galaxy moving inward. And so what happened locally essentially is that migration brings enrichment. So because of migration, then you can like build the, the wings of your metallicity distribution function as well, because now the local products is the sum of the, the, of the evolution in those different rings. So you sort of like smear out over the, the metallicity, age metallicity relation, which we saw before. And so you get like a very broad and sort of flat age metallicity relation. And not only that, because then you have like this dynamical evolution which goes on, essentially as stars evolve, because of the dynamical evolution, the, their velocity essentially get increasingly more scattered. So you increase the, the dispersion in their velocity as time goes on. And here you see the, the last plot, essentially you see that this increase in velocity dispersion, which essentially tells you that older stars then are found preferentially higher above the disk because of this sort of like dynamical heating that goes on. So, so far so good, but there is a very big uh, well, sort of a concern. So this is the galaxy, and the tiny little dot there is the sort of like volume, volume complete sample for which we can have like the sort of constraints which, which I showed you before. And that's the Geneva Copenhagen survey. Of course, there are like other surveys, like pencil beam surveys, which are surveying different parts of the galaxy, and that's fine. But of course, you can't survey the survey, uh, the, the galaxy completely. So you have to make decision. And that's fine, as long as you know how to correct for those choices. So even if you're not complete, you can still learn about the galaxy, but you have to correct for completeness or for the biases which you observationally introduce when picking up stars. And the other problem is that, for example, if you want to get stellar ages, for the Geneva Copenhagen survey, which is this 100 parsec volume, which is essentially the Hipparchos sphere, where we got like astrometric parallaxes, then that's sort of simple. Essentially, you have like your distances. You can place the stars on a nature diagram, modulo some Bayesian approach for isochron fitting, and you get your ages. And this is fine uh, if you do that in terms of globally as an ensemble of stars. That's fine. But again, if you take stars on a star by star basis, then you have to be cautious because the ages, well, even if you do isochron fitting, well, especially if you do isochron fitting, uh, they are not as as sound as they could be. So. 
And here is just, again, the same plot, just to clarify, we have typical observational error at the turnoff for solar isochron at different ages. And you see that within the uncertainties, you might have a hope to get the ages. But then if you move along the RGB, <coughs> the same observational error, typical 100 Kelvin temperature, then you're completely buried within the noise. So it's very hard to get ages for RGB stars. But if we could, then we have ages for intrinsically bright stars, which means that we have stars which are spanning a range of distances in the galaxy. And they're also long-lived stars, which is what we need to decompose or to reverse the formation history which has gone on in the galaxy. And so here is where seismology comes along and helps us uh, because of the oscillation properties of stars, and especially in terms of solar-like oscillation, the oscillations which are driven by convective motion in the, in the envelope. Of course, we are having lower degree mode that's shown here in the, in the picture, but the point here is that once we learn about the properties of the stars, and if we have several hundreds of stars or even thousands of stars, then we can really start to learn about the galaxy. And so I really don't have to go through what these figures means and those relations as well, because I presume everybody here know. The point here that is that you can get masses and radii. And to my simple mind, it means that you can get, eventually, ages and distances of stars. So does it work? In case of distances, well, we have the linear radius from seismology. And if we have like a tool, which is like this IRFM, which essentially is just like, let's say, is a tool that you feed photometry and you get reliable angular diameter. So the bottom line here is that you know the intrinsic size, you know the apparent size, and if you scale the two, the dilution factor is essentially telling you the distance. And here's in comparison with the stars with the Parkes parallaxes, and you see that it works remarkably well. So essentially, you can get distances as good as Hipparchus. Now, this is just a few stars, but we would like to do this for several thousands of stars across the HR diagram. And of course, the way to join the revolution is to go with Kepler or Corot, the satellites which are providing pulsations for several thousands of stars at different evolutionary status across the HR diagram. And in particular, up to now, well, the interest has been in, in, in the global oscillation frequencies, but there is much more to learn if we couple that with the classical boring stellar parameters such as temperatures and metallicities. And so to summarize what we need and what we dream for are distances and hopefully a large range of distances to span different populations in the galaxy. We would like to have ages to pinpoint when the event happens and so to put like a timeline on galactic evolution. We would like to be unbiased so not to have to, complete, to correct for completeness. In reality, of course, this is like not really possible, so please always read the fine scripts that it's not really possible to be unbiased, but at least if you're biased, you have to know the selection or the selection function of your sample so that you can correct for that. And then, of course, last but not the least, having the classical stellar parameters, temperatures, and metallicities. So with these properties in mind, we started a saga survey. So the Saga survey, essentially, the point here is to get Stromgren photometry for stars in the Kepler field. And Stromgren is a really powerful system because it really tells you uh, the basic stellar parameters that you're after. And we got some 20 nights on the INT telescope in La Palma, and more nights are, are, are going to be over the next uh, two years. So the results I'm going to present here are based on the first data release, uh, which has been observing this funny shape uh, in, over the sky. But it gets more interesting if you then turn this funny shape into galactic coordinates. And you see here that essentially uh, the color code it tells you is just like reddening map. And so we preferentially target stars which have like low, in low reddening region. And the, 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 this working. It does. So, and here the survey we are, we are targeting at the moment is this galactic stripe vertical. So at the base you have a cluster, which is an important benchmark point. And then you observe stars higher up above the disk. So you have your galactic disk, and you go up. And you possibly see this better here. So you have the disk, you have the bulge, your galaxy, and here you're surveying vertically uh, along the galaxy. And the point here is that essentially, since you do photometry with this wide field camera, everything that falls in the CCD area is going to be observed. So you don't introduce any selection, aside from the selection which can be uh, present for the Kepler satellite. But per se, as a photometric survey, you're going to be unbiased. And so now we have like about 1,000 stars, uh, which have seismic, seismic information beside the Stromgren photometry, plus altogether is some 29,000 stars. 
And we go to fainter magnitudes than, uh, than the typical Kepler range, which is at 14. So very bright magnitude and pretty easy to, to, to get with pretty short exposures. So here is just all the procedure that we use to derive classical and seismic parameters. I don't expect you to go through this. If you're interested, please have a look at the, at the detailed paper. But the point here is that essentially we, we derive the classical and the seismic parameter self-consistently. And so the parameters that we derive are, well, the ages from seismology, then the radii, the masses, uh, the distances, the metallicities. I didn't really touch upon reddening and effective temperature. And so can we use this information now to learn a bit more about the galaxy? So I recall you here the typical volume that we have for the Geneva Copenhagen survey. So 100 parsecs, very limited on the disk. And so what happens when we take like these Kepler stars observed via Saga is that we really are taking off. So now instead of a few, well, around 100 parsecs, we're going to observe several thousands of parsecs. So we are on the order of like a 10, a factor of 10 in distances. And here is just like a, like a nicer view to give like a flavor of the, the region in the galaxy which is being observed by Kepler and which, for which we can uh, use the constraint to learn about the galaxies then. So the point which I already mentioned before is that if you want to use uh, these stars to learn about the galaxy, of course you have to, to ask yourself how much is representative the population of stars which I'm observing, how much is representative of the underlying population which is in that field. And the nice thing of the Strömgren system is that it really easily allowed you to, to assess this point. So in this, in this plot, I show you two indexes. One is, well, essentially, it's a proxy of effective temperature. So you have temperature, and this other index is a proxy of uh, surface gravity. So this is like sort of like an observational version of the HR diagram, where you have temperatures and gravities. And so here is all the stars observed in the Strömgren survey, which goes like, 90 magnitude, but if we focus on bright stars, then here is what you get. And you really nicely see you have like the hot stars, then you have the turn off, and here is like at the base of the uh, RGB branch, and then here you have RGB stars, and here is like the, the, the faint sequence of dwarfs, which we don't expect to have very many at this bright magnitude limit, of course. And as a benchmark, here is the same sequence, which is for the Geneva Copenhagen survey, which is a survey of main sequence and dwarfs, dwarf stars. And for comparison, here is like uh, a sequence, an empirical sequence for metal poor giants. So that means that you, you can really easily uh, single out your giants. And once you have your giants in an unbiased sample, you can benchmark your giants against the Kepler sample, which is now shown in red. And so when you do this, essentially what you do is you scan in color and you see which is like the cumulative number of stars at different colors and you have like the unbiased sample and the Kepler total sample. And, and, and the same you can do in terms of magnitude. And so you see that essentially, well, the two, the two sample are not, are not comparable because of course, on the hot side, as well as on the cool side, where the time scale of those oscillation is longer, then you start to lose stars. And the same is true in terms of uh, magnitudes. So on the, on the faint end, again, you start to lose stars. But then you can correct for that and ask yourself which is the magnitude, uh, well, the color and the magnitude range where the two samples are comparable. So the underlying population is fully represented by the, the Kepler sample. And you can find that. And so once you find that, it means that you, you can have your unbiased sample that then you can use for uh, chemical evolution studies. And so here's just a teaser in terms of the age metallicity relation that you obtain with this subset of stars uh, being unbiased. And you see that it's pretty flat, uh, which is sort of like in agreement with the recent uh, models which have radial migration in the disk, as well as the MDF, the metallicity distribution function, again, with fairly thick uh, wings in, in accordance with those models. Now, if you have those stars, um, we have observed like this, this stripe in the galaxy, of course, you can ask yourself how things are changing as a function of galactic latitudes. So as you move up from the disk, and her, so here is just a teaser, uh, you see in terms of metallicity how it changes with galactic latitude and you can, well, you can fit and so you can find a gradient. Uh, I'm not gonna give any number as of yet, also because this is like projected in the sky, you should deproject in, in Cartesian coordinates. But the point here is that it's in, well, preliminary result tells us that it's in very good agreement, for example, to what is found uh, by the Sloan team using completely different data sets. And the same can be done in terms of masses. So you see that the lower latitudes towards the, the lower part of the disk, 
you have like uh, a wider range of masses, which tells you that there is a wider range of ages. And then as you go up in the disk, you have preferentially lower masses, which means uh, older stars. And here is just the same in terms of a contour plot. And again, this well fits in the, in the picture where you have like the heating of the disk and therefore like older stars get scattered higher up in the disk. And so whereas like younger stars are closer to the plane. And this leads me to the conclusion, which I hope I show you the power of astrophysiology for population studies and the power of photometric survey because they can be, well, they are unbiased. And so you can use that to benchmark your sample and find a selection for a, for a survey which was not designed for galactic purposes, but it's turning out to be extremely powerful and rich in that respect. And so that means that now it's possible to derive constraints for a galactic model similar to those that we had for the Geneva Copenhagen survey to other galactic regions. And I think this is just the beginning, and I stop here. Thank you. Questions? Eric? I may have missed something, but you, you gave us an appetizer with your 1,000 stars, uh, yep. Kepler. You did not show anything with them? Or? Oh, yeah, no. Do I, you have some preliminary yeah. results? Uh, yes, we do. I so, saw some Koro data, but... Yes. No, uh, sorry for that, uh, if it wasn't clear. So, yeah, what I show here is just the parameter we derived, and which are those parameters, and the focus has been more on, like, the, the power of using that for uh, chemical evolution studies. Uh, the paper where we describe how those parameters have been derived uh, is out there. So, uh, yeah, uh, I don't have any slides in this presentation about those parameters. Uh, if anybody wants to see any uh, result, please uh, well, come and talk to me. Or the paper is out, so you can have a look at the paper as well if you like. So, but yeah, uh, sorry if I didn't really highlight that. Okay. Yes, Mark. Uh, just very quickly on that point, I'll be giving a talk on Friday about the Apocask survey, but we actually do have a paper submitted with uh, masses and everything and uh, names of the targets and all that, so that's going to be coming up. No other questions? So let's thank again. Thank you. Luca.